Many of you, you have seen some of these uh, uh, scary movies where people are driving at night on the road, it's a storm, there are thunder, lightning, boom, tsh, you know, and then the car breaks, and then at the edge of the forest, there's an abandoned house that looks like uh, haunted or something like that. So people are running there. Like, imagine it is you, you're running for cover to this house. Then you come on the balcony, the porch, and it's creaky, the board is and then you hear the howling and the, and the wind and the trees and the shade, the shadows and all of this is very, very scary. Then you come in the house. Wow. Then you, 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 you each step like it makes noise and everything. Inside the room, when you come in, it's pitch dark. You cannot see anything because it's completely pitch dark. Inside the room that you don't see, there are scary sculpture, like demonic things, and uh, there's even piles of dung on the floor. You know, you don't want to step in these things, but you don't know it, you don't see it. And there are furniture, like, in the wrong places, so you don't know about it because you don't see, okay? But you imagine that in front of the, the door, the room is okay to be talked because you don't see anything. So you just imagine the room is okay. If at this moment you light, you switch the light on, everything will be exposed. You will see everything that is a problem. You will see how you can walk, avoiding the dong, avoiding the furniture, and you will see everything. With the light on, you can even fix the house. You can even find something that is nice and useful in the house because now the light is on. So which one is better for you? The darkness or the light? Ah, uh, yeah, I knew, I knew you would say that, okay. So in darkness, we, we are worse than blind people. No, because blind people, if they have been blind for a while, they have developed some other sense. The sound, the, the feeling, the touch, they can navigate better. But for us, if we go to get into darkness suddenly, we are worse than them. And the Bible says that we are groping, we are stumbling, we lose any sense of directions. So that's what darkness does to us. And that's why we need the light. So we are being the light. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. For once, the past, you were darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of light, light produces something. Light has in essence uh, qualities. Uh, that produce something, consists in every form of goodness, righteousness, and truth. It does something productive. It does something good. Light produces good things. And have nothing to do with the unfruitful, worthless, empty actions that darkness produces. So both darkness and light produce something in our lives. Both of them produce something. One is good, the other one is fruitless, empty, and all of this. Instead, expose them for what they are. In the Bible, in biblical history and biblical theology, the contrast between light and darkness is presented in a dramatical fashion. It's, it's all around. If you look at, the, if you do a search in the concordance on darkness and light, this, I cannot name the numbers of, uh, of verses that will talk about it. So what is darkness? What does it mean when the Bible says that to be in darkness? What does it mean? What does it produce? And we know because we have been reading the Bible long enough, light symbolizes God. This is simple, I'm not announcing anything new. Darkness is everything that is anti-God. 
like outside of God, the absence of God's presence, the rejection of God, the rejection or the ignorance of God's truth, having lost the right way of God. This is darkness. So darkness is often used in scripture as a symbol for sin. And we have it in the next slide here. And we have two scriptures. Job, when it is dark, what happens when it is dark? Evil people go out and break into houses. But during the day, they lock themselves in their homes to avoid the light. The darkest night is their morning. They are friends with the terrors of darkness. Isn't that right that in society, most of the crimes, most of the horrible things that happen are done during the night? I remember one time when before I was Christians, I lived just like that. This is a perfect description with me and my group of friends. When, when it says here, the darkest night is their morning, that's exactly how we live. We would sleep during the day and come alive in the, in, in the night and, and, and go out. This is exactly, and not to see what we were doing. John chapter 3 verse 19 and 20, we know what the scriptures says about that. People love the darkness more than light. People who do not want God. Their actions are evil. All who do evil hate the light. You don't want the light when you do evil. When you are, you know, when you hang on to evil, you don't want to have anything for the light because the light will expose will expose how ugly, it will expose the real person, will expose the real actions, and you don't want that. You want to continue your evil. So darkness, number two, symbolize also ignorance of the truth and inability to find the right way of God. And we have these other scriptures here. And the uh, second Corinthian, we know that the God of this world with a small g, Satan, the one who rules over people like if he is God, but he is not. And uh, he has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they cannot recognize the glory in the gospel. They cannot see what the gospel is really about and what it will, how it will benefit their lives. They cannot understand that. They don't see it because there's a reason why. And sometimes you may wonder why are not people understanding? The, the, the good message that, that is you're better with Jesus they, they don't understand it's because there's someone who is blinding their eyes with, with other times and this, we will know a little bit about that later a little bit more in the previous chapters we read that their mind has become dull a veil is blocking their eyes Ephesians chapter 4 the mind of unbelievers are darkened in their understanding and they are separated from the life of God, alienated because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hard, hardness of their heart, the hardening of their hearts. There is an ignorance of how God is love, how God is light, of the good things, of the good promises of God. There's, a, there's an ignorance of that. Isaiah 59 verse 9 and 10 describing very well our, our generation. There is no justice among us. We know nothing about right living. We look for light but find only darkness. Where can you find light in this generation? Where can you find light in this world outside of with, with Christian and in the church and society in general? Where, where can you find light and justice? We look for bright skies but walk in gloom. We grope like blind along the wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. Even at the brightest noon time, we stumble as though it was dark. Among the living, we are like dead. We, we cannot find. We are blind, we grope, we try to touch, we try to, to find a way. We look for light, but we continue to walk in, in the darkness. What happens in the dark? Sin grows in darkness. In Job chapter 24, verse 13, 15, and 17, there are those who rebel against the light. That's a good description. Those who rebel against the light, who do not know its way, or stay in its path, the light, the righteousness of God, they don't know the way. They rebel against that. The eye of the adulterer watches for dusk, he thinks, no eye will see me. And he keeps his face concealed. For all of them, 
Deep darkness is their morning. They make friends with the terrors of darkness. And this is again a good description. Here it used the uh, illustration of an adulterer, but it can be many other sinful actions, sinful things that the uh, darkness produce. He watched for the dusk because he feels comfortable in the darkness. He feels safe. Nobody will find out. And he says, no eye will see me. And he keeps his face concealed. And we, we see that. In Isaiah 29, verse 15 and 16, Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord, who do their work in darkness. And there's a reason why people do it in darkness, because they think, who sees us? Who will know? You turn things upside down, as if the potter were taught to be the clay. Can the pot say to the potter, he knows nothing? And this is a, a realization. Dallas Willard says, Almost, think about it for a moment and you will see how, how true it is. Principle number one, almost all evil deeds, sinful actions, and intents are begun with the thought that they can be hidden by deceit. Isn't that right? People commit sin or dare to do something wrong. They know it's wrong. But why is the people doing it? They're still doing it because in the mind, it's like we can hide it. Nobody will find me out. That's how we commit sin. That's how we dare to go out of the will of the Lord. We can hide it. I can hide it from the church. I can hide it from my parents. I can hide it from my co-workers. I can hide it from my wife. I can hide it from what, whoever. That's the first thing that people assume you know, even though we are really not aware of that, it's like it's like a, a taken for granted. Nobody will know. And this is the, the deception number one. All sins, evil deeds, and intents are begun with the thought that they can be hidden by deceit. I will just lie. Someone asks you, did you do it? No, I didn't do it. We just lie. We just deceit. Sin thrives in an environment of darkness, Lies and secrets. Is that true that lies is the best tool used to, to navigate with your sins, continue in your sins, uh, justify your, your actions. You, you lie, you deceit, you just continue, you make secrets. You tell someone who is a partner with you in sin, but you don't tell the other one. You have partners in darkness and in sin. You know, it's like uh, cockroaches. You know, uh, I had an experience with cockroach when I moved to Hong Kong. My, in my life in Canada, I've never seen a cockroach until I came to Hong Kong. Well, no, it's not true, I've never seen. I've never seen in my house. Because when I went to New York, I had seen some. But in my house, I had never seen a cockroach. So when we moved to Hong Kong, we, we, were, we were on a very, very tight budget. So with uh, Junior Kaufman for the old timers, you would remember, he took me to Sham Shui Po. And I bought my first fridge, because now we, we started to live here, so we need to uh, buy some furniture. So I bought my fridge, very ugly color, green color, uh, 500 Hong Kong dollars. Then I, we got a van, we brought the, it onto our flat. That night, we were eating uh, in the uh, dining room. So this is this kind of uh, little fridge with a, a cover like a lid. And then, as we were eating, there's a cockroach who fell <laughs> on the floor. Okay, the cockroach. So we killed it, continue eating. Pook. There's another cockroach that fell through the, all of the screw from the lid and fell. So my son said, Dad, Maybe we should unscrew the lid, and, and maybe we will find, which we did. And there was a nest of cockroach, <laughs> larvas, hundreds of cockroach. And as we opened up the lid, they just went <laughs> Wow, what an experience. Welcome to Hong Kong. 
<laughs> and my wife had seen that the neighbors had, you know, the, this, uh, this spray for cockroach on the window by the stairs. So she ran outside and she measured out in front of every door and the section of the house. She just, so, so that they would not go there and all of this. It took about two hours to, to clean and kill and kind of, kind of this. So sin thrives in an environment of darkness that's an illustration how sin thrives how it can multiply how it can successfully hide you know we only saw one little things that, that fell we saw another one but so what it's only one cockroach but under there were hundreds of them yeah well Praise God. Amen. So it doesn't work. We find out that it doesn't work. God knows the darkness. So this is, this is stupid to think in this way. That you can deceive someone, lie to someone, and continue in sin. This is not working. Because God knows the darkness. He knows where it is. And He knows what it contains. In Jeremiah chapter 23, it says, Can anyone hide in the secret place so that I cannot see him? declares the Lord, do I not feel heaven and earth? The other one says, my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from me, nor is the sin concealed from my eyes. It's, it's deceiving ourselves to try to deceive someone else and continue in sin because God knows it. It's not going to, to work at all. So it is safe for us to see this morning that living in darkness generally means living in sin with the consequences of that and the ignorance and getting out of the way. And it also means disobedience, rebellion and rejection of what the Lord is and what the Lord says. Ephesians chapter 5, it's not there. It says, have nothing to do with the unfruitful actions that darkness produce have nothing to do with that. That's the, the, the point. Light symbolizes the holy God. In the New Testament, God is the father of lights. That says in James that he dispels darkness. He's the father uh, of lights and he dispels darkness. And uh, we have the next uh, PowerPoint. We will find some of the titles named to describe Satan. And this is only a few because there's a lot of titles. I was looking at it yesterday. There's, there's so much. Ruler of this world of darkness and the gospel of John. Ruler of the power of darkness and Colossians and we will come back to that. Ruler of the prince of demons. Ruler of rulers and powers of the dark world. And the list goes on but I just took the one that relate to darkness. Only to, to the one who relate to darkness. But the list, the list is very, very long. And the absolute, you know, sometimes people think darkness and light, Satan and God, evil and good, it's equal. It's not. There's nothing equal in here. God is the ruler. He dispelled darkness. Darkness cannot stand before God. So never, never think about that. Never be afraid of Satan when you have God in your life. So just put it out of your way. Never accept to live, to live in fear. The absolute sovereign God rules over darkness and he rules over the power of evil. Light always involves, when, when you talk about light, you always involve the removal of, of, of darkness. There's always that happening. And I want to go to Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 because it's very, very important to, to us this morning. This is one of the grandest passages in all the Word of God on the person and work of the Lord Jesus. And I want to spend some time to look at the words that Paul used. This is short, this is concise, and it's one at the same time one of the grandest passage about the work of Jesus Christ and what it brings into our life. God has rescued us from the power of darkness and he has brought us into the kingdom of the Son whom he loves. Through whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Let's go word by word rescued rescued here is to rush out it's like somebody's going to drown and you 
rush him out of the of the uh, of the water. Someone is in fire, in the firefighter. It, there's a fire, and someone is rushed out. It, there's the idea of rushing someone out to to bring out to rescue someone like this. The power of darkness. The word here used for power of darkness is a different word from the kingdom. Because sometimes we have the impression, I, I used to think like this, you, take, you, have being, you are being taken out of a kingdom into another kingdom. It's not what it, it says. It's not that the text is like that. It is a, work, a word of great power. It, it, th there is power there, so th don't, don't be uh, uh, surprised at that. There's a great power. Power to enslave people. Power to turn people into monsters. Power to deceive people away from the truth. Power to make believe something that is not true. Power to destroy. Power to lead someone to suicide. Power to co uh, commit murder. There is nothing less than a greater power than this power to set people free. So you and I without Jesus have no chance because there is a power of darkness. And when you are in the power of darkness, you are enslaved there. You, you're like in a prison. You, you don't move out. You don't make a, a promise to yourself, I'm going to quit on Monday. I'm going to stop. I'm going to throw it in the garbage. I'm going to change next week. Yeah, yeah, I can set myself free. If you have been enslaved by any bad habit in your past before Jesus Christ, you know it's not working because you return to that. The, the, the enslavement is, is still there. So in order to get out, to get rescued out of this power, you need a power greater and there's only the power of God that will uh, achieve that for you. Only the power of God can redeem a man from the prince of darkness, from this universe of darkness uh, that is only. This prince of darkness who keeps men in ignorance and sin and in misery. He says he brought us, here in this verse here, he brought us. Uh, the King James says translated us. Sometimes it says transferred us. He moved us into. He transported us. Like different Bible versions use. Here it says brought. But actually it means carried away, transferred into. And, and something beautiful in that. He brings you somewhere else but one very strong idea in this verb is that he set you up he established you okay he takes you from being weak a slave uh, unable to free yourself in the state of servitude and he set you up he established something new you are changing not only a location you are changing status Something is changing in you completely inside and out. You are not behaving in the same way. You are not thinking in the same way. You change completely from, let's say, a poor people living in the slums, and then you would live a, in, a, like in a king with a, a, a title. The queen would uh, uh, give you the, uh, call you a duchess or uh, like a knight or something like that. You would receive a new title, a new position, a new identity. That's what it says. He translates you, but he set you up. It's, uh, I was thinking when I was was reading this commentary about uh, he, he took me out of the miry clay and he set me up on the rock. You see, that there's this picture like I was sinking in the sand and I was going to perish, but he pulls me out and he sets me on solid ground and a place of security. So there is this here. He takes you out of, of a place of weakness and he sets you up in a new person completely. This is important for us. There's a change of status. Jesus did not release you from bondage without a goal, without a very clear achievement, a purpose in your life. He wants to accomplish something in your life, so he pulls you out of here and he says, I know what I will do with you. I will set you up. You are mine now. 
I have good things for you. You have plans. You will be fruitful. You were fruitless. You were a slave. You were useless. You were worthless in a sense because of, the, of your actions were worthless. Not you as an individual because definitely you have value in the eyes of God because of what he did. But your, your actions were worthless, valueless. But says, I know I'm going to do something with you. So I'm setting you up with a new identity, a new calling, and a new ministry and all this. So it's really wonderful. He made, he made us victors over Satan's kingdom because now we are translated into a, <laughs> into a kingdom. <laughs> Ooh, we're talking about the king of darkness, then boom, it falls down. Remember one time when I was a new Christian we were at home. I was a new Christian. At that time in the church, they talked a lot about demons. You know, the church sometimes goes through some, uh, some kind of fashion. For a time, some, some churches go into a certain topic and they develop it. And we had a guy in our church, he always talked about demons. Always, always. And I remember we were Sunday afternoon. There was a thunderstorm outside. It was dark. I'm not making it up. It's a true story. And we are at the kitchen table and we are talking and he's, he's the guy, he talks all the time, but he always talks about demons and possessions and it's really scary stories that the things that he's telling us. And then as he's talking about this, then there's a big thunder, bang, and the light switch goes off and all this and everybody scream in the house. Yeah, so anyway, don't worry. Uh, we are translated in the kingdom of Jesus. So... In the kingdom of Jesus, here there is a different word from the word power. Power of darkness, I told you, there is power there. But here, it's different. It's the word basilia. It means, uh, the kingdom here, it means the sovereignty. Really, the, the, the kingship, the, the king, the rulership of the highest authority, the king. It's different. Before, it's a power. Now it's the absolute power, the foundation of power, the rule of power. So this one is stronger than the other one. So he brings you with him into that position. So before you were a victim and now you become a victor. Can you imagine? You have now victory over the one who had power over you. He doesn't anymore. You have that. You can command him in the name of Jesus and he will be chased away. That's why Jesus commanded to his disciples. He gave them the power to cast evil spirits. And the evil, or the evil spirit obeyed them. So that is the position, the great position that he has given to us. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. And then he says that he redeemed us. He paid our ransom to set us free. And he has forgiven us. Redemption and forgiveness, they go together. The forgiveness means send away or to cancel a debt. Okay. So Christ not only transferred us, but he has canceled all of our debts so that, listen to that, it's very important, there's a doctrinal point to that, that you will have to fight with, that you will put it in the, your, your toolbox because you will have to use it. Because of that, what Jesus paid as a ransom, that he sent you away debt free, you cannot be enslaved again by your old master. He cannot take you back. He cannot get to you he, any, anymore. Satan cannot find anything in the files that is against you anymore because Jesus Christ nailed it to the cross. Anything that condemned you from the past of your sin. So it's complete. It's done. It's paid. You belong to a new master. So the old master does not have the right to. And believe me, this is important because many churches preach something that is different than that. And it's not because they are evil people. It's because they have not understood what I'm talking about. They have not get that yet. And they tell people that, you know, you, maybe if, if you are struggling with power, with, with difficulties in your life, maybe it's because you have a bondage, a curse 
from a previous uh, generation, from your parents, from your grandparents, from the sinfulness of the previous generation. It, it did something to you so that when you believe in Jesus, yes, yes, you are forgiven, but the, the fact that you are struggling with you know, your spiritual life, it's, it's a sign that something has not been broken. And it's probably something that relates to your grandparents or to your parents from the previous generation. So we need to set you free. We need to break that bondage. That doctrine is very popular. There are Christian books written on that that are accepted. But this is against this text here. This text says no. This is not happening. You don't have to be afraid in the future of Satan. From the time you are born again, you cannot be afraid anymore. Satan, as another title, is called the father of lies. Oh, he is good. He is really good. And that's why people believe these kind of things. But the word of God, as I like what Brother Stephen was reading in the beginning uh, today, he says, which report are we going to believe? Are we going to believe the report that people tell us? about you know confusion with this or are we going to uh, believe the report of this one satan can make you believe that you have evil spirit in your life that you have a curse that we need to break the curse he can make you believe that and if you believe it then of course you are in trouble he has access to you that's why the bible says don't give a foot foothold don't, don't let him a crack you're out of my life it's finished jesus paid he, uh, he has set me up. I have authority over you. You don't have authority over me. That is the fact of the scriptures. So he, he cannot touch you unless you let him do. Unless you believe his lies. Okay? Or, or unless you would return to your old uh, sinfulness. But as much as it depends of the, 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 the doctrines of redemption, it's been paid. You've been sent away debt-free, and Satan cannot come back over that. It's done. It's achieved. You are a new creation. You don't belong to the darkness anymore. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So rest assured, because this is for your, for your security. There is for your security. The phrase, through his blood, reminds us of the cost of our salvation. And it tells something very important to you this morning. It tells you how much value you have in his eyes. You know, there is a word uh, in the New Testament that I like to use in marital counseling because it's, uh, that, that's how I use it the most of the time. It's the word to honor someone or give preference to someone, to show honor to someone. And the word is timai. And actually, this is the word giving a price. It's like, uh, okay, today we have um, a yard sale. Hey, hey. So the sisters have taken each pair of shoes and jewelries and, and t-shirts or skirts or whatever, and they have put a price tag on it. Okay? This is how much it will cost you after the service at 1 o'clock to buy. This is a price tag. So in marriage, when it says to honor one another in marriage, like how much price tag are you ascribing to your spouse? Is that the person that is the most important in your life? If yes, you will show honor. This is the, the price that you ascribe to that person. That's why sometimes you, a man can tell his wife, you are the most precious in my life, you know? Because it is like uh, an expression, this is the price tag, what you are worth to me. So here we see that here. When Jesus paid with his own blood, he TMI you, he put a price tag, how much are you worth to me? You are worth everything, every drop of blood. I have given my blood, I have given my life, what, what more can I see how much I love you and what you are worth to me? There's no more, there's no more word. You know sometimes uh, if you want to compliment someone, sometimes you come out of, of words. You are speechless. You would want to say something more, but or if you want to write a, a poem to your loved one or a nice card, you, you, you're looking for words, for ways to, to compliment the, either the, the beauty, the character of someone. But 
there's not enough. You would want to say more, but there's not enough. Your heart wants to say more, but your mind doesn't find the words, okay? But here, and this blood that Jesus shed for your forgiveness and your redemption, he tells you it all. This is how much you and I are worth for him. Salvation brings light to those in darkness. Hallelujah. Light. What is light? Light in the New Testament is the ultimate revelation of God's love in Christ Jesus. This is how you receive the light. Because outside of that, you have not yet received the light. You may receive partial light in the sense that let's say someone preached to you uh, the word of God. Uh, there is light in the word of God. Your light is a lamp unto my feet. You, you're learning something. Uh, th there's a partial revelation. There's a truth. You are receiving. You are being enlightened by the, by the light of the word. Your ignorance is being dispelled. Now you are learning that God loves you. That God proved his love when he sent Jesus Christ. You are learning that you are in sin. And that you need to get out of that. But God is able to. So there is, there is a, a, an enlightenment. You, you're getting something, you're getting out of ignorance, but light will come inside of you fully to give you this new life, the power to life, when the revelation of Jesus Christ comes to you. And not only the revelation of Jesus Christ, but it needs more than that. It needs the penetration. You see, you may receive a revelation, wow, this is great. But unless the penetration, the effect of that revelation will produce in you the change. Like you will say, yes, I receive your revelation. I, I want to be saved. I want to be in, in the light. So the penetration of that love into lives darkened by sin. This is how it will come to you. Amen? Hallelujah. So it's time to, to stop, and I have not finished, but we have to, to stop. So just stay with that truth, how much Jesus loves you, to bring you from darkness to light, and how much trouble darkness has, and this power that used to be there to deceive, to keep you out in ignorance and the, the freedom that you have received from the Lord Jesus. And God willing, we will continue to develop how to walk in the light and what it means and what light brings into our lives, these qualities of life that, that reflects Jesus Christ and His glory. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Would you please stand? Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's raise our hands to heaven this morning. We praise Him, but we will...